Welcome, everyone. I believe we are on time now to start um, our webinar. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Rodrigo Silva. I'm the Communications Manager at Cogitati Press. We have organized this webinar uh, in the context of the International Open Access Week 2023. This year's motto is Community over Commercialization. And we wanted, of course, to introduce um, to our audience, to the world, uh, Cogitati Press Institutional Membership Program. Okay. So this is uh, the structure of the webinar that we have ahead of us. We're heading for more or less an hour. I'll start uh, by presenting, as I said, institutional membership program at Cogitatio. So where do we come from, where we are at now, and possible steps uh, for the future. And then we will be hearing from three speakers, three representatives from three institutions that have been longtime members uh, of Cogitatio Press. We welcome Luis Otting from TU Delft in the Netherlands, Sena Toivola from Givaskila University in Finland, and Agathe Gebert from Gisis in Germany. I would like, first of all, of course, to welcome our speakers to the event. I'll give a little bit of introduction to our speakers before uh, they go. So let's start our event. I will now share my screen with you. And for those who don't know, I would like to start with a bit of context about Cogitatio Press for those who don't know. So Cogitatio Press uh, was born uh, in 2014. Okay, So we uh, are a fully open access journal publisher with four uh, journals, all in the field of social sciences, as you can see. Media and communication, politics and governance, social inclusion, and urban planning. A fifth journal is to be launched very soon in 2024, 2025. Um, in the field of ocean and society. As you can see, we are a very small open access uh, publisher, uh, although well-established with less than 10 years. Since we are here to uh, introduce uh, Cogitatio Press institutional membership model, I think it's important for us to start first with the financial context, so the financial background at Cogitatio, um, so that we can then jump ahead. So an important information that you have to know in advance is that we at Cogitatio Press, we have no private or public funder behind, okay, which influences, of course, our financing model, which is based currently in two pillars. Uh, an article processing charge for every accepted manuscript for publication and the institutional membership, membership program. So right from the offset in 2014, we realized that this article processing charge model would itself pose like a challenge, an obstacle for many researchers worldwide to access funding to publish their article with us. As we all know, there is an, an imbalance worldwide, a geographical imbalance, an imbalance per field of study when it comes to um, access to open access funding. And we knew that this would limit the access of many high quality researchers to publish their research fully open access uh, in our journals at Cogitatio Press. And so we launched this institutional membership program right from the beginning again, 2014, that goes as follows. The institutions that are members pay a flat fee in the beginning of each year, and all the affiliated researchers can publish fully open access in all our journals without incurring article processing charges. From the feedback that we receive, of course, from uh, authors, we know I know that we have some uh, researchers in our audience today. This is beneficial for all the agents. For the authors, um, because it allows them to focus only on the quality of the research without having to worry about open access fund publications, uh, bureaucracies concerning their European projects, et cetera. And for the libraries as well, the main target of today's webinar, because it actually simplifies the process. There is a single payment in the beginning of the year. And as I, I sometimes joke with this, um, but it's true, you only listen, you will only hear from us again in the beginning of the next year for the renewal of the membership. And in the meantime, throughout the year, there is no paperwork and no bureaucracy involved. So this is, in a nutshell, how the institutional membership program at Cogitatio works. Let's look at some numbers now to know where we stand. So as I said before, um, and have I shown in the, last, um, in the last slides, of course, the growing quality of the journals, the optimization of the editorial process throughout the year has led to an exponential growth of our members, uh, considering that we are less than uh, 10 years old. I remember when I started working in uh, Cogitati Press in back in 2016, 
as managing editor, we had only four institutional members. And today we have 84 members from all over the world. You can see the top three uh, by country in the, in the slide. But I would like you to take a special attention to the last point that I had in the, in the slide. So it is important to note that most of the members, the majority of the members, they see an actually an increase in the number of publications after signing a membership with us. This happens, for example, with um, TU Delft or GISIS, that, uh, whose representatives are here today. That happens, it's two of the examples. Uh, I know that in the audience, we have colleagues from, for example, Twente or IO University. This happens the same uh, with them as well, for your information. Um, and this information, this increase in the number of publications after the membership is important for two reasons. Okay. First of all, as I said before, it alleviates the financial pressure on the libraries since they do not incur in, in APCs. But the membership also serves as an opportunity for affiliated researchers to publish more and more high quality research in our journals, democratizing the system, so making it more accessible for everyone. So it's important to, um, so it opens the door without any financial constraints to more researchers. Um, so it's important to focus on the opportunity as well in the future for the membership, for the researchers of the member institutions. But where we are at now, I mean, some of you might be asking, yes, but how much you might be asking. Let us look at the numbers now to know where we where we stand. So this is where we are today. Even in our membership, we made an effort to make a fair offer of membership for universities with different sizes, from different geographies, because actually financially sustainable does not mean the same for everyone. Okay, so uh, this is currently the cost of our institutional membership, which is divided by the number of people uh, in the institution and the human development index. We did not invent this model. Uh, some other institutions use this, uh, this formula. And now that we have taken a quick look at the numbers, I would like you all to pay special attention to the cost of the article processing charge um, per, per accept article for publication. Okay? So by comparing the number, it is clear that by the second accepted article, the institutional membership is already more beneficial in terms of financing. Okay? And this happens with many universities um, that are with us today in the audience. Uh, this happens. There are also others that whose researchers collaborate with us very regularly but haven't joined the institutional program, might benefit from it, for example. Um, so it's clear that by the second article, the membership becomes financially more sustainable for the institutions. Uh, I did not want to uh, put the link here, but I will paste very shortly in the chat the link to more information about the membership, where you can see all the members, you can see all these numbers again. So some of uh, source, uh, some sources for you to consult. Let's look at the future now. Okay, so where do we? Uh, so what's the next steps for the future? Where are we heading? So as I said before, the growing quality of the journals, the feedback we've been receiving actually makes the publisher confident on the rising number of new members within the next years, as the list is actually updated regularly. The desired outcome in the future would be, uh, would be a scenario that we had a sufficient number of members that would allow us to make submissions APC free to all authors being from a member or not. So this means sustaining the editorial process only with membership support and abandoning the APC model altogether. Of course, this is a long-term strategy, a long-term look, uh, which would also imply perhaps a shift in the way some libraries, some funders, for example, look at supporting open access initiatives like the ones we have. For example, focusing more on the sustainability of the model, the benefits for authors and readers. Again, as I said before, the opportunities for new collaborations, for more submissions, for more quality research, um, financial transparency, issues of financial transparency, which we uh, pride ourselves in um, and focus, for example, less on how many articles were published by their authors only as the single factor to decide whether to subscribe the membership or not. This is, uh, in a nutshell, I'm getting close to my, uh, to my time. I would like to listen also to our speakers. So let me just wrap my presentation up, okay? So question at the press, as I said, we have this institutional membership model uh, as an alternative financing model to the article processing charges. And we have had this right from our offset in 2014, okay? So it's, this is a model with growing interest from both the authors and the libraries, which is proven by the 
exponential growth uh, of the number of our members in, in nine years. And this growing interest is because the system, the, the model is more financially sustainable. It's much simpler in terms of paperwork. It's transparent and of course con contributes to a fairer publishing landscape. I have uh, given my email here um, for everyone who wants in the next few days to follow up by email or follow us on LinkedIn. I am available to clarify any questions you have in the in the next few days for follow up. And I am terminating my presentation now because I'm pretty sure some questions arise and we want to listen uh, from our speakers. And I will start by introducing our first speaker, um, Louise Otting. Again, thank you. Um, Louise is the collection manager of TU Delft, the, the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Louise negotiates with publishers about uh, subscriptions and publications, manages the collection budget and open access funds, and heads also the collections uh, team. Louise and, uh, and the colleagues uh, offer several services to support researchers and staff at TU Delft uh, in practicing open science and publishing the research output in a sustainable way and you know, as open as possible. So without further delay, Louise, the floor is yours. If Louise, you can, you're if you muted. Mind. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm trying to share my screen now, but uh, as these things go, <laughs> they always uh, give some glitches once it's most important. Um, I'll try again to share it. Um, if everything's great, you should see my presentation now. Uh, could you give me a thumbs up if that's Not yet. Uh, happening? Uh, it's still the desktop. Hmm. That's quite annoying. Uh, we'll try again. Perfect. Yes, now we can see. Here it is. Wonderful. So my name is Louise Otting. I'm indeed working at uh, Delft University of Technology. Um, and uh, it's been uh, a very steep learning curve. Uh, my background is from the public libraries. And since about three years, I'm now working at an academic library. Um, also, my information is in this first slide as well. Should anyone have questions later on, feel free to contact me through email or through LinkedIn. Uh, I've been asked to uh, tell a little bit more about uh, the challenges we have as a library, but also oh, what is happening here, the challenges we have as a library, but also uh, concerning publications, of course. Um, so one of uh, uh, one thing we are very proud of at uh, our university is that we have managed to uh, get a very high percentage of open access. Uh, publications. Uh, this is helped very much by the situation in the Netherlands where we have a law that allows us to um, retain the rights to short scientific works and after an embargo of six months we can make those uh, articles, those short scientific works available through our repository. So this is indeed why we were able to crick up that percentage in open access, uh, um, access to our research output. Um, of course, we are also looking in other ways uh, to, to be as open as possible and to practice open science. Uh, and, and as a library and as someone who manages the budgets, it's very difficult to make this sustainable. Uh, we see an enormous rise in the costs of article processing charges that are not um, in any way related to a rise in the number of people working here. Um, or in the number of articles that are being published. There's a, there's a, a disconnect somewhere there. Um, and we are doing our best to make this as transparent as possible and to um, negotiate with publishers and try to find more sustainable ways of working together. Um, so we need to uh, track and forecast budgets. And as you can imagine, um, something like this membership uh, program is very helpful because it has a very clear cost that you can predict, that you can rely upon. With the system where we pay per publication, we see that the APC prices can be all over the place. 
um, and that um, uh, sometimes even during uh, agreements, the prices change uh, significantly, which makes it very difficult to, to get that budget under control. So this is one of the reasons that we are very happy with this model. Um, but as you can see as well, if you look at the dark blue and the light blue combined, because in the dark blue, there's quite a lot of um, open access costs as well, uh, uh, the cost rise significantly uh, throughout the years. And we do not see an end to this rise at the moment. Um, we see several concerns uh, within the publishing landscape. Uh, financial, I've already touched upon. Uh, but also in the well-being of our researchers, the, the publish or perish uh, is, is, is real and is felt by many of our researchers. The stresses are very high. And this is uh, um, because it's become, um, for publishers, it's become a model for profit. So they sometimes put even more pressure upon our researchers to keep publishing, 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 because that'll... Um, yeah, that, that'll bring them the profit that they are looking for. So it's not just a financial uh, concern that we have, but it's also in innovation, in the well-being of our researchers, in the efficiency. Sometimes time is very important uh, for other articles that might be less important, but now the pace and the quality is mostly in control of the publishers. Uh, and if there is no sense of community or of direct uh, personal uh, connections, then it can be difficult if, if those um, ideas are different from each other. And of course, morally as well, we feel that uh, the world faces many big challenges. And in order to face them, we will need to share research output with each other so that we can build on each other's output and find solutions for these challenges. Um, we try to create more awareness with our authors, with our researchers. Uh, we created a dashboard, for example, to show them a little bit more on the publication costs and also on the options that they have. And uh, as you can see, uh, Cogitatio has a, a very high uh, citation in our dashboard uh, to a low cost. So this is some of the yeah, places where we say, look into this, if this is a rice venue for you to publish. It is something that we'd like to promote to our researchers. They can uh, filter down on these dashboards to see uh, within their field what, what their peers are publishing and where they lie upon the high or low cost, high or low citations. And we hope to add a lot more alternative metrics to these as well. Uh, so we'll keep extending this dashboard. There is a link if someone would like to have a look and see what it looks like. Uh, I'll make this available uh, to you all. Um, but this has helped authors become more aware because most of the costs are being borne by the library. So they often don't have a real feel of what's happening. Uh, and it's good that we can uh, that that those publishers that we have a good relationship with and that we feel aligned with our open access values can become more visible in this way as well. Um, so where we have our uh, concerns in the publication landscape, we also see that this membership program uh, actually has an answer to some of those challenges. So we see that uh, there are very stable and predictable costs that make it more sustainable to publish open access. We see a big willingness to collaborate with us uh, and, and you see that it has a strong open access vision that aligns with our vision for open access. Um, and also it relieves the stress from the researchers that they're being pushed to publish more for more profits because the cost is stable. It doesn't matter if they publish three papers or eight papers. They do publish more, but that's because they have a very good experience and they can publish at their pace when they need it. Um, because the early release of the articles is also mentioned by our researchers as something that they are very happy with. Um, and of course, the emphasis on the quality, not on the growth. We see some other models where uh, you get an enormous rise in the number of titles and in the costs that um, yeah, that the quality goes down. And we see that at this publisher, uh, this remains very stable and that it's community driven if there, a new title is being added and it's being done very carefully and not 50 titles per year, for example. Um, so that gives us as a library a lot of trust as well that we can collaborate with uh, this program and that we can keep supporting this program. 
uh, the freedom to share, reuse, and use at all stages of the version of the article is also a very strong point in uh, in our opinion, which makes it a, a very good collaboration. Researchers are happy. Um, we see an increase in publishing. They mentioned that it is because of their good experiences. Uh, and from the library point of view, we are very happy as well. So um, we would definitely recommend looking into this model. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I remind uh, the audience that they are free to ask questions in the Q&A format. Share some comments in the chat if you are free to. If I did my job right, you are all able to do so. Um, we're going to be listening now to our second speaker, uh, Sena Toivola. Sena is an uh, information specialist at the operation uh, at the Open Science Center at the University of Givaskila in Finland. And Louis Sena specializes in open access publishing support. And Sena, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, and um, happy open access week to everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it now. Here we can. Yeah. So, yes, my name is Sanna Toivola, and I work as um, an information specialist at the Open Science Center uh, of the University of Jyväskylä, Finland. We are located in central Finland, and this year we are celebrating the 160-year history of the university. We have six faculties covering diverse disciplines. And I myself represent uh, the Open Science Center that is a unit consisting of the University Library and University Museum. And among library and museum services and science education, we provide a wide range of open science and research services on publishing research data management responsible metrics and open education. The Open Science Center has been an active promoter of open science for more than a decade now. Our publishing policy emphasizes the importance of open science and it sets guidelines for publishing at the university. For example, it is required that all research publications are self-archived in the university's digital repository. We do encourage uh, researchers to choose open access journals for their papers if suitable and affordable options are available. Uh, the university uh, complies with the Finnish Declaration for Open Science and Research and is uh, committed to make all scientific publications open. So what are the main challenges um, that we are facing when it comes to open access funding? Um, we have identified two significant problems, similar to those that Louise um, introduced. Um, they are research evaluation and the prevailing culture in scientific publishing and the increasing costs. To provide some um, um, background on the topic, I'll tell you a bit about the, uh, the Finnish publication channel classification system called the Publication Forum. It is a uh, rating system that is used uh, to evaluate, uh, evaluate the quality of journals. And publication channels are evaluated by panels, and each panel uh, is formed by discipline-specific experts. They use a three-level classification to rate publication channels, uh, three being the, the highest level and two leading level. Zero indicates uh, that the publication channel doesn't meet some of the criteria of level one, which is called basic level. Um, the publication forum classification plays an important role in, in the funding model of Finnish universities. Uh, the universities receive funding from the Ministry of Education and Culture, and a portion of their core funding is determined by the number. 
and quality of publications they produce. Uh, the quality of publications is assessed using these publication forum levels. And this brings us to the first significant challenge associated with OA funding. Uh, open publishing does not reward researchers enough. Um, they have the pressure to publish in order to maintain a position in uh, the academic community. The more you publish, the better if you get your papers accepted in top journals, even better. So researchers tend to uh, prefer high impact journals. And in the Finnish context, journals that have been rated level two or three by publication forum. And these journals often are either not open access or, or they charge expensive publishing fees. And as long as the funding model and research evaluation are based on journal-based metrics, this won't change. And that is why we have to direct attention towards responsible researcher evaluation. The other major challenge in open access funding is money, of course. And according to the, the latest monitoring, Finnish research organizations spent over 21 million euros on transformative agreements and over 4 million euros on separate APCs and BPCs on publications that the agreements did not cover. And this is quite a lot for a relatively small country like Finland. And Finnish organizations agree that the current cost level is unsustainable. So these are the topics we are struggling with. And next, I'm going to talk about the, the, the membership program. We've been a member for um, five years now, and media and communication and social inclusion are the two journals that researchers from the University of Uvascula have published in. Uh, we have 12 articles and a book review, and our researchers has, have worked as editors as well. Not all researchers have funding for publication fees. And um, Cositatio offers potential publishing channels for them. And I'm one of the team members responsible for answering uh, researchers' questions regarding open access publishing. And in my, in my experience, um, there have been very few inquiries from researchers concerning the membership. And I take that as a good sign. Uh, the other workflow seems uncomplicated. And compared to all the effort our transformative read and publish agreements re require, almost uh, no administration is needed. We don't have to verify our researchers' affiliations or approve article requests, and it saves us time. We appreciate that articles are published under a CC by license and Thanks to the license, the final published versions of articles can be self-archived into our institutional repository. Finally, um, I contacted a couple of researchers that have, have published under the agreement, and the feedback was very positive, as you can see. The authors pointed out things like good collaboration, excellent communication, clear author guidelines, streamlined publishing process, and high quality reviews. And last but not least, not having to take care of APCs. Uh, it's very nice to hear that our researchers have been this satisfied with the membership. And so are we at the Open Science Center. So thank you. Thank you, Sana, for the presentation. We are also very happy to hear the, the feedback from the researchers at uh, Givaskila, of course. Uh, we will now jump to uh, the final speaker, Agathe Gibert. Um, Agathe started her career as a co-editor of a scientific journal and gained some experience in uh, medium-sized publishing houses. 
Since uh, 2009, she works in the area of open access, being responsible for the biggest repository for the social sciences, SSOR. She heads the team library and open access at GISES, the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. Uh, next to licensing, she advises the staff at GISES on their publication strategy. I got. If you could unmute as well the, the mic for the presentation. Sorry, you can see my, I, I still have to do the uh, presentation. Yes, we, presentation. we can see, yeah. Um, but you see those slides, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Thank you very much for the introduction. Sure. Um, I'd like to add, actually, I'm also uh, at the moment head of the whole department, uh, Knowledge Exchange and Transfer, which uh, had three teams. That's the team publication, the team training, and the team um, library and open access. And I'm responsible for um, assigning an open science strategy to the whole institute of five different departments, which encloses uh, open access, open data, open methodology, and open source uh, for the software development. Now, I'll give you a short introduction into um, GESIS as such, and then I come to an end, the conclusion of why we participate in Koshitatio's institutional membership program. Now, GESIS in relevant numbers, we are very small uh, compared to all the universities that have been presenting. Um, we have uh, five research departments. Oh, first of all, let me tell you, we are an institute of the Leibniz Association in Germany. Now, Germany has uh, four different or five, four different uh, research organizations. The Leibniz Association holds institutes, uh, about 100, that uh, provide infrastructure services to their respective communities. So the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences, GESES, would um, offer infrastructure uh, to uh, the social sciences. We have five research departments, about 218 publishing scientists, we publish about 150 journal articles a year, uh, 45 in hybrid open access, rising because of the transformative agreements, 25 in genuinely open access journals, and about one to three articles in the four cogitatios journals. There might be one a year, there might be three, there might be none a year too. Um, when it comes to uh, open access at Gizes, um, we have two objectives. One is to encourage our staff uh, to open to publish open access, but also offering open access publication possibilities. But at the same time, as an infrastructure institute, we need to encourage changes in the relevant publication systems uh, in our communities. Now, GESIS started in 2018 by offering a disciplinary repository, which is so far the biggest repository for the social sciences in the field um, and offers services for self-archiving, but is also churning into a publication platform for uh, Diamond Open Access. In 2012, uh, we introduced our first uh, open access policy that provided advice, uh, funding and infrastructure services to our staff to publish open access. In 2019, as everybody else, we started with the big transformative agreements and deals that um, have so far opened a lot of uh, publication um, options in the hybrid journals. But whereas, frankly speaking, these agreements do very little impact on the open access transformation in our fields as the flipping that was promised with the transformative agreements doesn't actually take place. We also encourage in other initiatives, uh, engage in other initiatives of which Cochitatio's institutional membership program is one main feature. Um, through Cochitatio, we enable and encourage our staff to publish open access in generally open access journals beyond the hybrid journals of the big publishers. By paying a yearly membership fee, we also pay less money for uh, the articles as we would if we would pay APCs. But I come back to close this up. We, we also engage in uh, Koala, which is an, a consortial uh, it's a consortia that uh, fosters collaborative funding for open access journals and book series by academic libraries, research institutions, and associations, and provides also provides an alternative to the dominant APC model where articles are paid for individually 
by authors and their institutions. And the last thing is we also engage in Enable. Enable is a joint together of publishers, libraries, book traders, repositories, and other stakeholders but, uh, to engage in cooperative open access publishing. Now to sum this up, and this really is my last slide, but it's, it's important uh, to sum it up why we participate in Cochitatio's membership program. Uh, it enables us to offer our staff to publish comfortably in four open access journals with no individual APCs. But it also enables us to offer an open access publication option in a small medium sized publishing house that is still very important to the social sciences and humanities. So thus we contribute to the necessary publication diversity that threatens to get lost with the big deals of the transformative agreements and foster open access transformation in the publishing sector in the social sciences and humanities altogether. So beyond, beyond ensuring comfortable and less expensive publication options for our staff at GESIS, we also contribute to a fair, sustainable and diverse diverse publication system in the social sciences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agat, for, um, for, the, for this presentation as well. Uh, we, have, we have reached the end of the presentations. I have a question here uh, that it seems has been answered, but I will make a quick follow-up as well on the question that was answered. Uh, the audience can still make some questions if they want, and our speakers are always free as well to uh, cut me off and make and ask questions uh, to each other as well. We have a question here. I'm going to read it uh, because this webinar is recorded and uh, people, when they watch it after, it's important to know what the answer was, the question was. So the question is, is it only institutional membership that is provided? Um, what about personal or group membership? This is because there is a possibility that an institution might not show interest in registering or might take a long time to decide. Uh, I will follow up on this with two different ways, although the answer is always uh, no, we do not have person or group membership. Sometimes that is true. Sometimes uh, after the interest shown by an author to uh, subscribe the membership, the institution is either not interested or takes a long time to decide, depending on the internal processes that go. Alternatively, what we do sometimes to overcome a little bit this problem is to sign the membership either with an institute inside the, the university, for example, or a department, because sometimes they have also the funds to uh, make these kind of memberships. However, our preference is always the institution as a whole, because it opens more opportunities for more people and not some departments or institutes uh, inside. The second, uh, second idea is we do not have uh, personal or group memberships because this would put the focus of the finding in the researcher as a person, we do not want to do that. So our idea is to um, have the collaboration with the institutions as a whole to allow the researchers, as I said before, to focus only on the research and not having to deal with financial bureaucracies uh, with the publisher. This is how we would answer it. Um, I believe we have no more questions. So I think we've, we have had these three presentations which were very useful to complement my presentation in the way that we have three different geographies, three different sizes, uh, a little bit more or less uh, common challenges, though, uh, which is important. I believe speakers and I will be able to some follow up uh, after this. Some final information before we close the, the webinar. So a recording will be available for everyone to watch. So um, we will notify all the participants when the video uh, is on. I am available to uh, clarify any questions by email, as I said before, um, if you have in the meantime, in the next days. And while closing, of course, a survey will pop up. Let us know what you thought if you want. It's not mandatory if you liked the webinar, if it was useful, if it was um, clarified or not. And I would like to, again, thanks to Louise, Sena, and Agata for being here today. And of course, to our audience for being with us today. Thank you very much. Rodrigo, there's actually one more question in the uh, FNA section. Uh, the, asking about how what Cogitatio's viewpoint is when it comes to peer review uh, and publishing research data related to the article. Your vision does, uh, yeah, thank you. Question Your vision is that welcome to Bandit. It's much better regarding more open exercise prices. What's Cogitatio's viewpoint when it comes to open peer review and publishing related to the article? Okay, so in Cogitatio Press, we um, we only publish research articles that have not been published elsewhere. For now, we only use a double blind peer review. There is no um, intention for now, no plan for now to change this model that has been working with a high quality um, 
inside. So we have several ways to also guarantee, of course, that this peer review uh, is well done. Something that we can perhaps think in the future, but for now, it's not um, it's not in our plans. Thank you, Agat. I've completely missed it. So uh, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Luis, Sana, and Agata. We'll be in touch, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, thank you. you.